Constantine brings in a very interesting experience and uh, uh, the story about the product that I myself am excited about. But I asked him to represent the topic as if he is a Harvard professor and not as a software vendor. So, I'll try not to sell you guys. Yeah, <laughs> but there will be a selling piece, there will be a video, right? Uh, yeah, there'll be a cheesy piece to it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, standardized risk measurement, this is you know, one way we sometimes call that, but the main thing you'll hear over and over today is structural quality. The industry's really trying to do a better job of putting a number on it, some metrics, some standardization. And that's what our friend who runs uh, OMG, Richard, he's really trying to educate the market as well in this. So what I'm going to cover today is three main things. What we do versus what we don't do. Just to kind of get the definitions out there uh, to help you wrap your hands around that. And really after that, those will really be like one sliders that will give you an idea. This is what we do versus this is what structural risk is not. Then we will dive actually into structural risk. How do you measure it? How do you go about um, really getting after it and fixing things if you find some critical issues in your applications? And you know, last but not least, because we are talking about enterprise software, and you know, a lot of this goes into Fortune 1000 companies who are huge, you really need a way to implement it. So I'll go through what it would be like to implement something like that in a fictitious company. And then throughout it, I kind of put in these sanity checks, because a lot of this conversation is going to be theoretical in, in so many words, that every now and then I want to put in how does the real world look at it? How does this apply to the real world? Process versus product. So process is something that has a lot of metrics around it in organizations. So we will not talk too much about that today. So we're really here not to measure the process. Today's discussion is, how do you measure the end product? Oh, and a quick sanity check again. This is taken from a client before a release goes into production. This is a cr business critical application. All this stuff up here is still processed. There's, you know, how much did they spend? And they actually worked with outsourcers on this, which is becoming very standard on the market. This client over, the, over time has added in TQI, which in this case is Total Quality Index. It goes from 1.0 to 4.0. So every release, they measure this application, in this case 2.61, and they benchmark it to what is the industry. So this comes up a lot. Functional quality versus non-functional. And in this case, you know, functional, let's say this top piece of the iceberg, it's is the application doing what the business user wants it to do? We will actually not be talking about that too much. We're going to be talking about the non-functional piece of it. How is it engineered to perform? Symptoms versus root causes. The symptoms are seen in many different ways. Something acting slowly, you're having outages, having defects. What we're really going to be talking about today is what leads to these symptoms? What causes that to happen. Executives want to know before something goes into production, is there high risk associated to it or a low risk? Sometimes this risk lies in a system for many years before something huge happens and it, the whole system explodes. A quick sanity check again, this is just a case study uh, from a large telecommunications company. So pretty much what they did is they wanted to know these external quality, internal quality. So they were measuring their defects in production and so forth but they were never measuring the structural quality piece. So they started to aggressively work down those issues and aggressively address these uh, violations of best practices. And they wanted to see what kind of correlation would there be. And they saw a very strong one, you know, 385 production issues here at the beginning of the year, down to something like 11, as they really put effort to stabilize the system. So you have the code quality, which is like a hygiene of the code from a developer standpoint, almost like a spell checker for a paper that you may write. And then you have the structural quality, which I guess if you're thinking like a term paper, it's not just good enough to turn it in and have everything spelled correctly and you know the grammar being correct. Hopefully there's a structure in place and a plot line and development of your thesis uh, perhaps in it. So the structural quality, which again, sometimes gets called different things. And I tried to streamline it, but you'll hear it you know, sometimes called system level quality. Sometimes it's called application quality. It measures how the individual components fit together to create a larger piece. And this is what really we're going to be talking about because this is becoming more and more relevant as these systems just grow to complexity levels we've never seen before. Uh, again, another sanity check. So why is this important? Why does structural quality even matter? 
The structural flaws account about 8% by volume of the overall of flaws that we find in the code itself. When you look at how much effort it takes to fix those things and remediate, it goes to almost half. And that's partly because they're very difficult to find. But to me, I guess the most interesting one is 90% of downtime are caused by only 8% of the design level or structural level flaws. So when you're a IT executive answering to the CEO, you really want to make sure that you tackle the structural part, the part that really impacts the business. I took this slide from an executive who was uh, giving a, a lecture, and it's just interesting as he, they were adopting some of these quality metrics and really trying to have everybody think quality, and he, you know, they were asking different folks around the organization, they were getting different answers. Basically, what this is saying is there's a lot of miscommunication on quality. How, what is quality and what does it mean? And it seems the higher you go, the more detached these folks are and the more they kind of are very skeptical and don't know. Because a lot of those tools that the developers use, to be honest, they stay down here. It's very rare that even the application owner ever sees any results, any stats, anything from those solutions or, else, or puts it into any kind of way that they can understand and communicate risk. And what I try to do is bring it up higher, which could be very disruptive. Uh, so now I'll dive into the actual structural risk and what it looks like. Now to a business person or you know, to a user of this technology, an application probably just looks like a black box. But obviously when you open it up, it becomes very complicated very quickly. So once you map it out, you can do some interesting things to it. You can tell what are the different transactions that flow from the UI and down to how they hit the database and how do they go through, through the different frameworks and so forth. So then you'll start to apply these best practices from OMG, from CISC, from these other organizations, and so forth. How are the different technologies interacting with each other? Let's say you have a .NET or Java, and something's wrong, something's going not right with the code. But it may not be .NET or Java. It may be the way it's speaking to a certain database that really, that's where the breakdown in communication is happening. The other interesting part is you start to find bottlenecks in the system. You start to find components that are used much more and are called much more than other components. Let's say this red box accesses 90% of this application. If something was to go wrong there, it may collapse the whole system. So structural quality really tries to get at how do you pinpoint where the points of failure could be and how do you make sure that you prevent that from crashing or from going down or performing slowly? Just as an example of this, uh, you know, we call it propagated risk index. And this is getting at what should you go after first, what should you go after second when you're actually finding these violations of best practices. This picture here, it's an application mapped out. And the red pieces are all the different communications. So what you start to pick up on is that there's certain pieces that get used and get called over and over and over. Again, not dynamically, but from the way that the system is built and the way that the system is designed. There's a number that's put onto this propagated risk index or PRI, and if you sort it by that, you can kind of go after the things that have a larger impact versus smaller. Here's an example of a low PRI or propagated risk index versus a higher PRI where tables being accessed by many different programs, many different things. So pretty much what it says, and just to sum it up, is something in here, in this component, has a certain violation of best practices. And when you multiply it by how it propagates through the system, you come up with this index, which by itself doesn't really mean much. It's just to pretty much put things in order. You start to see that if you truly want to go after risk and how it propagates, if you fix things in here, it's going to give you a much bigger impact than if you fix things in here. So one of the sanity checks here is this term now, nine digit defects are coming out. These are defects that are causing a hundred million dollars or more of revenue impact. So this is no longer just an IT problem. You have issues like this, it goes up to the CEO, it goes up, it goes up to the board of directors. These are serious issues. For instance, you know, Goldman Sachs, their platform went down for 14 minutes one morning and it cost them about a hundred million dollars. And it's really scary how much power these systems have. And that's some of the reason that the Securities and Exchange Commission is thinking of putting legislation in place to make sure that they develop their systems in responsible fashion because this stuff can set off chain reaction that's global. Here's an example of a website. Let's say you have three different teams that are working on this stuff. 
and they all scan their code like they should with the developer tool, developer solution out there. So in this particular example, they scan it separately and it looks like it's good quality. So no issue, good to go. Now from the structural quality aspect, where you should scan the entire piece of it, the question comes, would it be the same outcome? And in this specific case, we would find that there are some things that are not optimal with it. So from a performance standpoint, we found some remote calls in loop, SQL queries inside of a loop, and on top of that, it's hitting a really large database that's not indexed. If you really want this application to perform through peak seasons, you're gonna run into issues. Another sanity check, and on the bottom here, they really mapped out software structural quality. And here they mapped out the incidents they've been finding, and also they've scoured for data of how much losses that some of these departments are facing. So they put this together to show their executives. The more we follow the best practices, the best structural uh, quality practices that are out there in the industry, the smaller our losses tend to be and the less incidents we have. The less we follow it, the more all over the place it is. It's not that they're all losing money or they're all, it's just unpredictable. Uh, so when you have risk, sometimes it manifests, sometimes it doesn't, but it's still there. Technical debt. This is a way to quantify all of the structural quality issues that are inside an application and put it in the terms of dollars. A simplified ver way to calculate this is, so you have all the structural problems and issues that you find, and then you, you marry that, you multiply it by the hours it takes to correct those issues, and, and multiply it by the rate, the hourly rate that you would pay a developer, or, you know, whether it's offshore, onshore, however your, uh, you know, your organization does it, and it gets you to this technical debt number. Just like with real debt is if you don't do anything about it, it grows interest over time. So this is a way for CIOs to communicate an issue that's very difficult to communicate. Bill Curtis, who is our chief scientist, he's really going after quantifying this and getting this measurement in front of executives out there. So now it's coming to how do you implement some of this stuff? Large organizations, this happens all the time. They buy software or they build software and then it just goes on the shelf and sits there for 10 years because nobody wants to implement it or knows how or anything like that. In our case, we need to have conversations to say, where do you want it to live in the SDLC? Because uh, for our product specifically, it can live in multiple different places. Maybe for your products or other things that it has to be in a specific area. Because this really gets to the uh, organizational question, who's gonna own this? Who's gonna run this? Where is it going to live? Who's going to care about it? Who's going to consume the information and the data from something that it would deliver? For our specific product, again, we need to get the source code. So you need to have somebody in the back office running it. Then we need to, with a client, have somebody on the front office who's an evangelist that this data that gets generated, that it's going to the right place and that these people are using it. How are these people gonna be re reading this information? Is it through a dashboard? Is it through reports? Or what a lot of clients sometimes push us to do is integrate it into their other systems that are already there. Long story short, there's a lot of points where this can break down a lot, a lot of things that you may have to map out to get this to work the way you want it to in a large organization. When we start with clients to set their expectations correctly, we say, listen, you are here. This is what we start, but we're gonna take you to the roadmap of making this repeatable, making this defined, managed, and then optimize. Sales guys like to paint the picture up here to the executives, and that's fine, but then the executives buy it, and they throw it to somebody to implement it, and those guys have to breathe into paper bags because they're uh, you know, having a panic attack, and they don't know how they're ever gonna do this. That's where you really need to have a way to scale up in the appropriate manner. We are uh, at the end. I know that um, that was a lot of information to kind of breeze over pretty quickly. Feel free to email me, and you guys can look me up on LinkedIn if you would like. And the slides are posted in the lectures folder, mm -hmm. so you have all this information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Good job. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And you're welcome to stay because we'll have a case discussion now. I would time. love to stay.